All right, so we're recording now. So uh, Adam, thank you so much, brother, for taking time for this. You're a busy man with a family and leading a church, and and that's actually just kind of the tip of the iceberg, everything you do. So thank you so much for carving out some time. I appreciate it. Good to be with you, brother. Thanks, man. Thank you. Well, let me, um, uh, for our friends who will be listening in, let me give you a little introduction here. And uh, and then I'll kick it over to you. But uh, I've known Adam for uh, I dare say like 18 years or so. It's it's been a minute. Okay. Um, I can say in perfect honesty that in that time he's always been this handsome. I don't think he's aged at all <laughs> during those 18 years. Uh, but he, um, gosh, he's had so many roles. When I first met him, he was working for the denomination for our conference. Uh, for most of those years, he's been pastor of New Song LA, which is a, a really, I mean, a, a truly wonderful church in Culver City. Uh, multiracial, multi-ethnic. Uh, it's a church that I've tracked with a lot over the years. I've looked to you guys just just to see how are you doing things. and and all manner of questions. Um, my family was able to worship with you guys on sabbatical this last summer, which was super fun. And my family loved it. Um, yeah, my, in fact, out of my daughters, they, uh, we visited a number of churches and they said, you know, of all those churches, you and Adam preach the most alike. And I was like, yes, ah, <laughs> high compliment. So, I think um, it's the haircut. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be. I think it might be. Um, yeah, so uh, in, in addition to that, uh, I think people should probably know you've worked in the space of racial reconciliation for a long time, both inside the church and outside of the church and the business world. And, um, it's, it's an area where you've done a lot of good thinking and, and an area where you've taught me a lot. And I know anytime I've had a chance to be in your presence when you're talking about these things, I take it. And so um, I'm grateful that you would do a one-on-one -on -one with me here and uh, and just do some talking for me and for our church. So thanks, man. Well, it's a pleasure, Tim, and and great to be able to communicate with your congregation too. Of life, uh, you know, I, I, I'm also an admirer of you and the and the commitment that you guys have made as a congregation to planting other churches, being involved in missions so aggressively. So you, you guys are really setting a pace for us. We, uh, we actually have conversations in our staff meetings about uh, the things that you guys take on. And then we appreciate partnering with you too. Uh, I had a great conversation with Israel recently um, about uh, how things are going with their church. And so cool. good to have a conversation, buddy. Thanks, man. Thank you. Well, uh, well let, me, uh, let me throw out a question here to get us started and you can take it wherever you want. But uh, I'd love if you could could just talk for a bit about kind of what it's like living as, as a man with dark skin, uh, living as a black man in our society and in the church. Yeah. So, um, you know, everybody's life experience is different, but we find that when there is some type of triggering event in the United States, we'll often get very different views coming out of uh, the white community and the black community. And this incident most recently is, is a bit different in that everyone had the same opinion of what happened in the video with George Floyd, you know, pretty much. And so you get this overwhelming international multicultural reaction, you know, when, when the crowds in Berlin are larger than the crowds in most American cities for protests. Uh, something different is happening. There's an awakening to uh, to the kind of things that people in the African American community have been reporting for years, um, and it's kind of fallen on deaf ears. Uh, so I, I'll get a little bit of background about myself because I can't speak for all African Americans, but I can tell you a little bit about one guy's journey. Uh, I grew up in the Catholic Church and. I grew up in a neighborhood that was very multicultural. So on my block, you know, you had a, a, a Mexican family, a couple African-American families, um, white families, you had a Japanese family one block down the street, 
Chinese family one block down the street. All of us rode our bikes together, hung out together. Uh, you know, we there were times when, when there were racial tensions, but that stuff wasn't dominant, and um, and we weren't isolated from one another. The schools that I went to were the same, and whenever um, some type of a <clears throat> whenever some type of a, a racial slur was used or something at the Catholic elementary school I went to, uh, that was an immediate trip to the the principal's office, and the nuns would intervene. So uh, that's the climate that I grew up in, and I I went to church with. Um, people of, of German descent and, and uh, Filipino and, and all kinds of Latinx, you know, people. And so when I was a teenager, I started reading the Bible. My, my father was Catholic. My mother had come from a Baptist background. And as I started reading the Bible for a number of reasons, um, I got more and more hungry to study the Bible. And I couldn't find anyone within the churches that I was tending who could teach me that. And my dad actually got a referral to a little Baptist church that wasn't that far from our house. And I started going to this church. Well, one of the things that I noticed was that I was the only black person there. The neighborhood that this church was in was probably one third white, one third black, one third other. Uh, but the church was almost entirely white. There was one Mexican guy there. Uh, and then eventually there was one uh, uh, group of Chinese kids that started coming, Chinese teenagers. One uh, um, Korean American kids started coming and then they proclaimed themselves to be diverse you know it was, it was an interesting experience so for me being in that setting wasn't that strange because I was used to being around different kinds of people but for them it was incredibly strange and the comments that people would make to me were just bizarre uh, you know um, racially insensitive statements um, but that pastor he was in his mid-50s which at the time I thought was old uh, and uh, I was about 16 when I started going there. By the time I was 17, I received the call to preach at that church. I had been teaching the, the youth group whenever the youth pastor couldn't come there. Uh, I would memorize anything he told me to memorize. I would read anything he told me to read. And eventually they said, you know, you have a gift of teaching. We want you to fill in for the youth pastor on occasion. I started doing that. And then... Um, I remember people starting started to say, you seem to have the gift of preaching. And I just laughed because at the time I, I was good in math. I thought I was going to be an electronics engineer. And um, I was in student government. So making speeches was no big deal. But finally, I started sensing the Holy Spirit might be telling me this, that this is real. So uh, at 17, I had scheduled a meeting with my pastor. I said, you know, what is it like to write a sermon? And he just started asking me a series of questions about how I think when I'm listening to a sermon. And like, you know, do you ever think about what the notes look like or how you would give the same talk? And I said, well, everybody does that. He just laughed and said, everybody does not do that. <laughs> so, so eventually, actually, now I think back, it was, I was 16. So he, he had me preach my first sermon there in the evening service. Uh, and I just remember this feeling is like standing under a waterfall and trying to spit a little bit of water out. Uh, so I, I knew I was called to preach. Well, that guy taught me how to outline scripture, taught me how to prepare sermons. Uh, after one year, he recommended that I go to Biola University. After one year at Biola, uh, he handed over the adult Bible study to me. There were several guys in that Bible study with master's degrees in theology. And I was like, why are, you, know, why are you having me teach this? And he says, I know what I'm doing. You, you, you've got this. And, uh, and he said, stay one week ahead of them. And if you have any questions, ask me. And sure enough, I found that I was able to hold my own in this class and, you know, we would debate things and I could, I could debate things from scripture and I was thinking, wow, you know, there's something going on here. But the fact that this man saw me when I was so different from him and I was the first mm -hmm. black person to my knowledge he'd ever been in a personal relationship with. Meanwhile, let me back up a little bit. So this was at the age of 19 when I was teaching this adult Bible study and and then every Wednesday night, he would tell me where I was preaching the following Sunday. He would schedule places for me to preach in these congregations, mostly rural, 100% white, these churches he was sending me to. Wow. Um, if you rewind back to when I was 16, when I first started going there, I tried to share the gospel with my friends at school, with my brother, with my, uh, my cousins, and they had a chance to go to camp, you know, and I, I heard people get saved at camp. So... I used all the relational capital I could, Tim, to get my brother and my cousins, all my friends to come to this, this camp. And 
uh, they would teach us the Bible in the morning and then we'd play baseball and stuff in the afternoon. Well, a friend, uh, the, the only Korean guy there, pulled me aside and he said, did you see the lesson for this morning? He said, I think you need to read it before we go in there. And I read it and it was talking about dating and it was saying, you know, you're a Christian, you should only date Christians. And I'm thinking, man, this is great. It's just what teenagers need to, to hear, right? I kept reading and it says, and you should only date within your own race because God does not want the races to intermarry. And I remember being absolutely shocked. I'm like, what in the world have I gotten myself into? It's, it's, I felt like I just stepped into the twilight zone. By then, I had a very strong relationship with this pastor. I looked up to him. I knew he loved me. I loved him. Uh, we go into this, this youth group meeting, and I've been in my cabin on my knees going through scripture, looking at all the references that they're using. And it became very clear to me that they were twisting the scriptures. They were looking at the passages where... Israel was commanded not to intermarry with the surrounding tribes. And every time God said that, he, whenever he gave a reason, he didn't always give a reason. Whenever he gave a reason, he said, or they will lead you to worship their gods. And then I right. looked at all of the, the intercultural couples in the Bible. I looked at, you know, Joseph marries an Egyptian priestess, then Rahab marries Anne, and Moses marries a Midianite, on and on. I'm like, God clearly, you know, first of all, race didn't even exist in the Bible. So it's a foreign concept to try to read into scripture. Um, but I, still, I saw that God had no problem with people of different cultures intermarrying, and Israel was, was mixed with all kinds of people. It was a spiritual issue. Fast forward to the New Testament, obviously the issue in the New Testament is don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. So I go in as a 16-year-old, armed with, the, with these scriptures, and begin debating with the youth pastor and the senior pastor. And wow. it was a very difficult thing to do. I felt I had no choice. Uh, the kids in the youth group are looking at me like I've got two heads. I was very respectful in what I said, but um, you know, when, when he's, at one point my pastor says, well, why don't you trust my reading of the Greek, Adam? And I said, with all due respect, sir, I trust the multiple translations I've looked at it and I can read English just fine. Um, my brother lost it, he started crying. He said, you know, I thought only the Ku Klux Klan thought this way. So that was my sort of shocking introduction to the racialization of the church in America. Since wow. then, I've learned a lot more. And if, if you guys haven't done a book study uh, on this book yet, I highly recommend The Color of Compromise uh, uh, by Jamar Tisby. That, that book is probably the most concise historical record of how the church engaged issues of race along the way. There are other, plenty of other books out there, but they tend to be more dense and academic than this one. And you'll find a lot of familiar heroic characters in there. Uh, it goes back before the Revolutionary War and shows how race was constructed. It was constructed for economic reasons, uh, the separation of people of European descent from everyone else in order to have a class of free labor. Um, eventually, the laws in America, even the founding of the, of the country, it was structured around dancing around this issue of race. They didn't use the word explicitly but they, they built the country around this framework of race. It, they would never have been able, in fact, you could argue, to create a union at all had they not compromised on the issue of race and allowing slavery to continue in the South and not addressing it. But there was always this anticipation that in a future generation, we'll fix that. Uh, the Declaration of Independence refers to Native Americans as savages, and one of the complaints in the Declaration is that King George did not protect the colonists from the savages. So the United States was formed with the exclusion of the indigenous peoples written into the founding documents. Uh, so those, those words, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. In the minds of the framers, it did not include uh, people of African descent. It did not include indigenous peoples in the Americas. It was referring to white males. And it says men on purpose. Women did not have the right to vote. But gradually, those words became um, the tools by which people could reconstruct the union and to create a more perfect union. And so America continued to wrestle with this throughout the years. The laws uh, for, you know, for slavery, where they were constantly debating, how are we going to uh, count slaves in the census, for example? And they decided, we'll count them as three-fifths of a person. And uh, what are we going to do when a slave runs away? And they create the... Fugitive Slave Act, which required anyone to return a runaway slave to their master 
you know, whether they're in the North or anywhere, and there, no documentation was really required. So even people who had been free their whole life in the North were captured and sold in the South during that time. Eventually, the whole thing erupts into the Civil War. And I won't go into the, the barbarism and just the level of horrific treatment of how slaves were captured, how they were transported across the ocean, what happened in the, in the Caribbean and all of this. I, I feel that our education system is horrible in America. It doesn't teach this stuff in detail. If you really want to know what happened, you have to go looking for it. But I'll share one idea just to show the kind of religious tension involved. Uh, the first ship to go to the West African coast to pick up slaves from England was named Jesus. Uh, wow. There was the first time that slaves were picked up by the Portuguese, which they kind of began that West African slave trade. Um, there was a, a person there who was the personal uh, sort of ser a personal editor of the Prince of Portugal. And he is describing the horror of what he's seeing, the torture of human beings, the shackling of them, um, you know, cramming them into tiny spaces with no place to put their excrement, all this stuff he's putting into the, the journal. And, and he's saying, my tears wet the pages as I write these things. And I know that my prince is a Christian man and I trust that what he's doing is right. Okay, so this guy's having this, this crisis of conscience at what he's watching. Meanwhile, there's a priest there to receive a tithe from the cargo. So the church was complicit in, uh, in the construction of the concept of race. The church was complicit in the slave trade. It was complicit throughout the centuries as racism adapted uh, in the Americas. Uh, but the church was also filled with champions who fought against it. People who fought against slavery, people who fought against segregation. Um, often these champions were also uh, people of kind of uh, products of their time and compromisers in their own right. So you'll have people who were against slavery, but they still believed in segregation. Or people who, you know, were, were for the conversion of the slaves, but then they would fight for people to remain slaves even after they're converted. Uh, in fact, when a person was baptized, one of the common recitations of a baptized uh, person of African descent was, I am doing this to get to know Jesus, not so that I will be free. They had to basically renounce any hopes of being freed by becoming a Christian. Because European wow. law forbade the enslaving of a fellow Christian. I'm rambling, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually add one more historical point here. Oh, this was to, good. That, to that point about the forbidding of enslaving fellow Christians, which was explicitly rejected in the United States when it was formed, that dates all the way back to 1452 when the Pope issued a decree uh, to the Prince of Portugal at the time saying, wherever you find non-Christians, you may steal their land, or he didn't say steal, but you may take their land, you may kill them, and you may relegate them to perpetual servitude. That decree was updated by another Pope years later and, and applied to all of Europe with the caveat that whoever gets there first, whichever European country gets there first, lays claim to the land, similar to the, the California gold rush. So that's how co uh, colonization happened. You know, I grew up, like many of us, just accepting the world that I was born into. Colonialism was something that happened, right? But I never really questioned why did it happen, how did it happen? It happened in the as, as a result of two papal bulls by two different popes declaring that Christendom, the, the you know, the, the Christianized Europe, had the right to go and take land from anyone who was not a Christian and kill them and enslave them. So that led to a mad scramble for all the European nations to try to get there first. That's why they colonized Africa, South America, uh, the Caribbean and North America, and they tried to kind of lay our flag and we discovered this, this is ours, right? With no regard for the indigenous peoples because those indigenous peoples are not Christians, they don't count. Um, I want to fast forward to, the, to uh, the Civil War, largest, bloodiest war in American history. Hundreds of thousands of people died. Um, and uh, afterwards, during Reconstruction, you have people who have been enslaved for hundreds of years actually rebuilding their lives, joining Congress um, and the state legislatures, building an economy for themselves. They own farms, they had businesses, they, they, they were lawyers, they were physicians, everything. Uh, but 
the South made a deal with, um, with Rutherford B. Hayes to withdraw the Northern troops from the South and allow them to kind of um, beat back the, the Negroes and handle the Negro problem however they wanted. That compromise led to the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and uh, domestic terrorism in America. Um, thousands of, of people of African descent were tortured to death and uh, you know when, when lynching became the, the norm and, and people really don't understand also the extent of lynching. The level of torture that was done here, we're talking about maiming people while they're alive screwing hooks into their bodies, pulling out pieces of flesh, men and women, beating them till their eyes are dangling out of their sockets, cutting off members of their body while they're still alive and giving it to people for souvenirs. Uh, this again is not something that we're taught thoroughly in school. So if you really wanna know what happened, you have to kind of brace yourself and go back and look at it. During that time, the, the, uh, the church was, was making decisions as well. And most American churches, most denominations either defended slavery or tried to stay out of it and, and not uh, take a stand against it. The Baptists had a big fight over it. They, they argued, this is before uh, emancipation, they argued that over whether a slaveholder could uh, become a missionary, for example. And Baptists in the North said, no, slavery is evil and uh, that should disqualify somebody from being a missionary. But the, the, the uh, Baptists in the South said, that, that it's not wrong and they try to point to scripture to try to defend it, which there's nothing like uh, Western chattel slavery in human history, let alone within the Bible. It, so they were comparing apples and oranges, but uh, you know, the Bible says anyone who is a man stealer, kidnapper, and they're right. found with someone in their, um, in their possession, that person is to be put to death. So it's pretty clear this was a capital crime according to scripture. But, and but Paul reiterates as well that slave traders will not inherit the kingdom of God. Exactly. So it's a New Testament concept too. Yeah. But out of this, the Southern Baptist Convention was formed. So that whole denomination formed as a, uh, as a defense of slavery. And each of the Confederate, nation, or the Confederate states, they put in their charters that they were doing this in order to maintain slavery. So when people try to glaze over that history, it was over something else. It's over state rights, blah, blah, State rights to do what? It was over slavery, right. okay? Right. Uh, so during, after Reconstruction, you get into Jim Crow, and I'm gonna bring it to modern day here really fast. If you think about what happened to Ahmaud Aubrey, you got three guys that jump into a truck because they see an African-American guy jogging who, who goes into a, uh, uh, a, a construction site and it's kind of looking around the construction site and conti continues his job. They chase him down in a truck. Why would they feel compelled to make some type of citizen's arrest? Why would they go grab their guns and say, we are going to take it upon ourselves to uh, arrest this guy because we think he's committed a crime? Um, to understand that culturally, we go all the way back to what was called the slave patrols. In, um, in the slaveholding states, it was required of any white male to patrol the movements of slaves. Because slaves, people who were, were enslaved, they could, they could go and buy uh, you know, um, grain or something for the plantation, come back. So they were moving around. And how do you keep these people from escaping? Well, en enslaved people were patrolled by the, right, the white community at large. And you'll notice with this concept online of the Karens, you know, that basically, it's white women who are calling the police for whatever reason on uh, people of color. That mentality that, you know, I have a right to police your movements, that was embedded in American culture as far back as slavery and it persisted. So it's sort of a, 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 uh, a cultural uh, um, mentality that we have a right to be here and we will decide whether you have a right to be here as a person of color. Give you an example of this within the church. I went to a uh, pastors convention uh, with New Song Church and New Song was the only group of minorities or group of people of color at the convention period and I'm trying to remember the name of this group I think it was called the um, something leadership whatever but it was you know these supposed to be elite pastoral leaders you know all the, the, the who's who speakers are there 
And I remember a guy walking up to me, Tim, and he's asking me, where are you from? You know, what church are you from? And I, I mentioned the church and all. And he says, uh, did you go to, to, uh, to school? You know, where did you go to school? And I told him about, you know, I got a graduate degree here. I got a graduate degree there. And he's like, oh, okay. And he walked away. And I said, wait a minute. What about you? Where'd you go to school? You know, what's your background? What qualifies you to be here? I didn't say it that way. But you understand his mentality. He's looking at me and thinking, why are you here? And are you really qualified to be here? And I found that that attitude is right below the surface in our churches, in our Christian schools. Um, Well-meaning people still harbor this sense of superiority that leaks out in, in ugly ways that they end up having to apologize for afterwards. Uh, so I would, I would say, you know, you mentioned the work that I do. I do consulting with organizations that want to be multicultural, usually for profit reasons. So big multi-billion dollar plastics manufacturer in Abu Dhabi, you know, bring me in for a retreat to, to work with their 11 vice presidents from all over the world and teach them how to play well together so they can make money without running into problems of miscommunication. That's the kind of stuff that I do. I have found that it is much easier, Tim, to work with for-profit corporations that want to be diverse and want to uh, overcome cultural differences and really leverage their cultural differences as an advantage. Uh, it's easier to work with them than it is to work with Christian organizations and churches. Uh, I find among evangelicals in particular, the greatest resistance to this and um, the greatest sort of innate impairment when it comes to understanding the perspective of a person who is different. So I'll stop there. Wow. With my monologue. Well, oh, <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, maybe just a, a, gosh, I have a bunch of questions, but maybe just right where you left off there. Um, why do you think that is with the church? Why the resistance when at least on, on the face of it, it, it seems to me that, that I'll push back on this if you think I'm wrong, but it seems to me that a majority of evangelicals would say, of of course, I believe they were, that we're equal. They would affirm that, and I think they would mean it. Where do you feel like the resistance is coming from that you experience when you, you're trying to work against the culture that's there? That, that's a great question. Uh, I think it's theological. Um, it's cultural, but it's really rooted in our theology. So imagine throughout the centuries the cognitive dissidence of a person who is trying to reconcile uh, holding slaves or segregating and all of this with the Bible that we read, with yeah. the Jesus that we worship. I mean, it's some major mental and emotional and spiritual gymnastics to try to sort that out. So what developed was uh, a um, compartmentalization of our faith, where mm. there is a personal relationship with God, and that makes me a moral and loving person, and it makes me a person who will inherit eternal life when I die. And then there is the economy, and there is the, re the realm of politics, and there's the society and the laws, and all I need to think about when it comes to law is Romans 13, obey the governing authorities. Meanwhile, in the background, there are others who are constructing the laws and they are building the society and designing the economy and they're doing that along racial lines. And so Christians were taught individual responsibility, individual conversion, don't look at things collectively, don't look at things systemically because you're just headed into trouble when you start looking that way. And now that has become so deeply embedded into American culture but even deeper into evangelical theology. This focus on personal responsibility, the rugged individual, the pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Uh, and, you know, it's my personal relationship with, with God. I mean, it just oozes out everywhere. You know, he yeah. took the fall and thought of me above all. Really? Show me that in scripture. I mean, our, our, yeah. our hymns are wacky, man. They're all self-centered, personal stuff. Whereas when you read scripture, Usually when you come across the word you in scripture, it's plural. God is constantly talking to communities of people. Um, if there was a crime committed in a, in a, uh, in a uh, town in Israel, God would hold the entire city 
responsible for what one person did wrong. The responsibility is collective and it's multi-generational in scripture. So we don't get this idea from the Bible. We get it because of people trying to reconcile, in my opinion, reconcile mm -hmm. uh, societal structures that are designed in an evil manner with a personal relationship with God. I'll give you some examples of people. So some of my heroes going to, going to Bible college and studying the word and, and all, uh, guys like uh, Jonathan Edwards, you know, he was a slaveholder, guys, and defended slavery. Guys like George Whitfield. Not only did Whitfield hold slaves, he used slave labor for his plantation in order to fund his orphanage. He tried to convince the other people in the colony of Georgia to allow slavery. He petitioned Parliament. Parliament said no. He did it illegally. So he, he defended and practiced slavery uh, while he's one of our greatest evangelists. Even Charles Finney, who actually would evangelize both uh, um, people of African descent and people of European descent, he still maintained segregation within his churches that he was founding, and he made sure that people who were black could not hold any office within the church. So our, our greatest heroes and theologians, they compartmentalized Christianity into a personal relationship with God. You don't look at this other stuff. Now, go to the turn of the century, um, the modernist movement, and a concept called the, the social gospel, where people were starting to say, look, there are implications to the gospel that are clearly social. Um, in Europe, you had guys like William Wilberforce, the Clapham sect, they were trying to put a stop to, to slavery, you know, way back, and uh, as well as all kinds of like child labor, all kinds of things. They saw that our faith impacts how we engage all of life. But in America, when you had this social gospel, it was also associated with liberalism that said, you don't have to have a personal relationship with Jesus. You don't even have to believe the Bible. You just do the things Jesus said were right. And that was the social gospel. The backlash to that was furious. And it came out as the fundamentals, these documents saying there are fundamental things you have to believe. But that pendulum swung so hard away from social action and into personal conversion um, that it made this problem that was already there even worse. Add to that the rise of... Uh, of you know the Schofield reference Bible and uh, this focus on the rapture that you just get as many people saved as you can because Jesus is coming back any minute uh, what is the deal Moody who said God gave me a lifeboat and said you know save as many as you can so our focus is on conversion our focus is not on how we live um, in an unjust world but when you look at the Bible it's a completely different thing God introduces himself to Moses as the one who has heard the cry of his people God's concern is first for the sin that was committed against Israel. And it's not until he gets them away from oppression that he begins to give them the law and show them the sin within themselves. Um, Jesus is looking at people who are oppressed and he's not condemning them. He says even to the woman caught in adultery, where are your accusers? I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. He's focused on people who are being oppressed and abused and delivering them from that first. And then he deals with their personal responsibility for sin. We preach the gospel completely different from that. When Jesus sees injustice in the temple, he protests. And he frankly protests in a violent way, overturning money changers and driving out their sheep. He would have been arrested as a, as a criminal, as a rabble rouser, um, if, if he were doing that today. So our theology gives us blinders when we look at scripture. So when I start talking to people who are evangelicals, about the need to engage um, social ills and that God wants us to make sure that the society we live in uh, is, is conforming to his nature, they'll say, you know, what about this person's personal responsibility and we're not supposed to deal with systems. That's what's the verse they like to quote. Um, no, no soldier in active service entangles himself in civilian affairs. <laughs> uh, God doesn't consider uh, calling political leaders to account civilian affairs. If he did, John the Baptist wouldn't have done it, and Jesus wouldn't have done it. Right. Paul right. wouldn't have done it, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, oof, man, I, I love that, and thank you for, um, I'm looking for I, I, think, I think that answer, that, that rings true, that, that dissonance, and I think, I think how deep in our theology is um, how deeply we've syncretized, I think, with the American dream and concepts like rugged individualism, personal responsibility, 
Uh, and of course, personal responsibility isn't absent from scripture. It's all through. That's right. But, but we uncouple it from our, our society, our responsibility to love neighbor, uh, to, um, well, I, I think, I mean, side note, but even it's interesting listening to churches who have been protesting during COVID and our right to open and whatnot. And, um, where I know for us and for many churches, uh, we've been more focused on, well, what's our responsibility to the neighbor? You know, what's it going to mean if, if we are reopening too soon, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. Can I throw out another question for you here? Sure. Um, on that question of dissonance, and I imagine for a lot of my brothers and sisters who are going to be listening in on this conversation later, um, like there's some dissonance going on right now, um, particularly uh, those who maybe are less familiar with some of the darker parts of our history as a nation and the darker parts of our history as, as the church, capital C Church. Uh, do you have any suggestions for folks who are trying to figure out, okay, how do I, how do I hold a, a proper love of country to the extent that's acceptable um, with things about my country that past or present, uh, I know are wrong. How do I hold my love for God's church uh, as with its flaws, you know, in, in light of telling the truth about places where we've gotten it wrong? Any, um, any thoughts for managing the dissonance there? That is a great question, Tim. Wonderful question. Uh, I should say I am a patriot. You know, I was part of Boys State in uh, high school and Boys Nation. I got a briefing in, as a junior in high school by the, the, the different branches of the Pentagon and set in on Supreme Court meetings. It was showed all over DC by, uh, by the uh, congressional aide, met George Bush Sr. in the Rose Garden because Reagan uh, had just come back from Camp, D Camp David and sung American hymns on the feet, uh, uh, at the foot of the Jefferson Memorial. You know, we were in the paper singing these things. So I've got American culture and love of country deep in my heart. You know, my father served in the military, my uncle served in the military. But I think what we have to do is what you do when you walk into a shopping mall. You walk in, you look, you, you know you're, you're headed somewhere, but you look at that map, right, of, of all the different stores and where they are, and there's that little sticker that says, you are here. When we read scripture, we need to find that sticker, and I want to suggest a location for you. So, uh, all right. We are in Babylon. We are um, Daniel and his companions. And if you look at how they behaved, they loved their Babylonian uh, neighbors. They were commanded in the letter to Jeremiah, settle down, make homes for yourselves, uh, you know, get married, have your children get married, pray for the city that God has sent you to because as it prospers, you will prosper. When yeah. Daniel addressed Nebuchadnezzar, he said, O king, live forever. When he found out that God's judgment was coming upon Nebuchadnezzar, he said, I wish that your vision concerned someone else. So he clearly loved the, the Babylonian nation and the people that he served even in government. And he was at the highest level of government. But he never was mistaken about who he was. He understood his, his identity as a member of the people of God. And whenever there was a conflict between what God said he needed to do and what his country said he needed to do, that the country in which he was a captain, he understood how to make those decisions. We have, you used the perfect term, Tim. We have a syncretism that's going on in our theology between American nationalism and the Christian faith. And we, deep down at some cultural level, believe that God is on the side of America. He is not. God is on his own side. Even when Joshua meets the angel of the Lord in the book of Joshua, he says, are you for us or for our enemies? And the answer to that multiple choice question was a true or false no. <laughs> right? <laughs> but as the captain of the Lord's host have I come. God is on his own side. And yeah. there are times when God would, would declare God bless America, and there are times when God would declare woe unto America. And our job 
is to be the prophetic voice within this country. If we love the country, then we need to say woe to America when America has committed sins and has not repented of that. And, uh, and not glaze over that. A, a, a prophet that loves its, uh, that loves, um, its nation will not uh, tell, tell the nation what it wants to hear. That's what the Bible warns about, people having itching ears and surrounding themselves with those who will say whatever they want to hear. Um, if we love our country, we will be that prophetic voice. I also think our understanding of how we engage politically or how we engage in this whole realm needs to shift from being passive uh, to what does it look like to be active. So during the 80s, the rise of the moral majority, it was Francis Schaeffer who really challenged these prominent evangelical leaders to engage politically. But when they did it, Schaefer himself was shocked. His son speaks out about it all the time, that the way they did it was, was self-centered. It was horrible. Um, the coalition was formed in response to the desegregation of schools. Bob Jones University was, was threatened to lose their IRS uh, tax exempt status because of their segregation policies. Um, private school movement, the Christian private school movement, was, was started as a way of segregating schools because the public schools were being integrated by force. Virginia shut down their public schools for years so that they would not have to go along with the government's rule of, of, uh, of desegregating. So this rise of the private school movement in, uh, among Christians was in response to segregation. And the Christian coalition came together around that. Now they found that that's not a very popular thing to recruit about. So they picked abortion as their primary recruiting um, uh, tool and um, uh, LGBTQ rights, LGBTQ rights. So those two things they thought would be much more popular to try to galvanize people around. I can't give you a documentary history of this, but if you research what I'm saying, you'll find that I'm right. So I, I challenge people, if you think, if what I'm saying sounds shocking, please check me out. You'll discover this is exactly what happened. So given that, when we engage politically, we are, we are engaging really in the wrong category. Personal morality is usually not what God says to politicians. So I started looking through the Bible, Tim. What does God tell politicians? What should we be saying to politicians? And here's a great passage in, Jer in Jeremiah chapter 22. So um, he's talking to a, a king, and then uh, I won't read the whole thing, but I, I'd say go from verse 13 through 16, but I'll just read 16. He's talking about the previous king, the father of the person who's just become king. And he says, talking about his father, he said, um, well, I'll, I'll go to verse 15. Does it make you a king to have more and more cedar? Did not your father have food and drink? He did what was right and just, and all went well with him. He defended the cause of the poor and needy, and so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord? And you'll find the same kind of language in Proverbs 31 when uh, King Lemuel is being told by his mother, stand up for the cause of the widow and the orphan. That's your job. A politician's job is to protect the vulnerable from the strong. So you'll find all over and over again, God says, protect the widow and the orphan and the foreigner and the poor in your midst. He just, it, it becomes like the refrain of a rap song. He just keeps repeating that hook over and over again. So if we're going to engage politically as Christians, that's the agenda we should have in the political political arena that seems to be god's political agenda but does he talk about the need for a politician to be moral to not be uh you know a womanizer or a drunkard yeah in proverbs 31 he says that but he says otherwise if you do these things if you become a womanizer and a and a drunkard you will forget the law yeah so that's basically a qualifier he's saying don't be intoxicated and don't be compromised when it comes to uh, your sex relationships because you're gonna forget the law and you forget that your real job is to protect the poor protect the orphan protect the foreigner um, in and the widow uh, So anyway, I, I kind of lost track of the original question but, you know. <laughs> No, you I think you answered it and then some and I I think that's really I think that's really helpful. Uh, I think particularly because in my experience, one of the stumbling blocks that people run into when they start trying to get their their head around questions of you know a concept like systemic racism or structural inequities, it's really hard to know what to do. Yeah. You know, if we're talking about personal morality, it's like, oh, okay, 
stop doing that. You know, there's like a ready-made solution. When you start talking about systems and structures, it's it's like, man, you know, where do I even start? So I, I think I think you've given a really wonderful starting place or a grid at least to think mm. about how we engage with larger societal issues. Well, um, as you as you reframe it that way, a couple of other things come to mind, Tim. Uh, to know kind of a guy, you know, a guide and how to engage, like you're saying. Yeah. Um, so I think that the difference when you look at systemic stuff is you measure outcomes. You don't measure intentions exclusively. Intentions are important. There are people who maliciously manipulated the law. For example, example under Nixon, uh, one of his key aides was Ehrlichman. He's a very fascinating guy, but he's gone on record. You can find this article in the Atlantic where he explains what the strategy of Richard Nixon was. He says, in 1968, we had two enemies, um, the hippie movement, the anti-war hippie movement, and the blacks. We could not make it illegal to be anti-war, and we could not make it illegal to be black. So we criminalized drugs, and we associated the hippies with marijuana and the blacks with uh, with heroin, and that allowed us to disrupt their meetings, to go, to break into their houses, to arrest their leaders, to do whatever we want. And you, you look this article up and see what Ehrlichman quotes us. He says, I would quote it for you, but I don't want to take up too much time. I got the article here somewhere on my desk. Um, but he says, um, he says, did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. So here's a government official intentionally creating a law that will give them cover to go after their political enemies and they considered their political enemies to be the, the anti-war hippie movement and blacks. And if you look at what they did after that, they started they, what they called the war on drugs. Um, they would run into people's houses, I mean, in some cases with the Black Panthers, blowing people's heads off in their beds. Um, mm. and, but they would claim that they thought there were drugs in there. So this whole thing was a way of structuring laws to get political enemies out of the way. And if you look at mass incarceration, you'll look at the, the results of that is millions of people with felony records that can't vote, right? That's part of, the, of a very deliberate strategy. But, but intentions are not the only thing that we measure when we look at systemic stuff. We have to measure outcomes because sometimes those outcomes are unintentional. So a great example of that we find in the book of Numbers. In Numbers 27, God had given Moses the the law directly from god and in that was the inheritance rights and inheritance was through the males and it was by tribe and family etc well these daughters of this guy named zalafa had in numbers chapter 27 they come forward and say hey this isn't working for us because our dad died um and we have no brothers and so his name is going to disappear from the record and there'll be no ancestral land for us and moses in in total humility takes the case before the Lord and the Lord says, give them their father's land. And not only that, Moses, change the law permanently so that women will inherit if they have no brothers before any uncle or anyone else make a permanent change to the law. So that's an example of there's no intention to oppress anyone, yeah. but that's the net effect. And God says, change it because of the effect that it has, not because anyone intentionally oppress these people. And that's, that's something we have to think about as evangelicals, because our, our natural tendency is to say, wait a minute, I don't have a hate in my heart for anyone, right? That's not the point. The point is, is there something systemically happening that has a negative outcome for a group of people? And so we have to measure that. This is uh, two last verses I'll read. One in Isaiah chapter 10, verses one and two, it says, woe to those who make unjust laws to those who issue oppressive decrees, to deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. I would encourage everybody to write Isaiah 10, one through two in the margin in Romans chapter 13. Wow. <laughs> Corollary passage, the laws have to be just. Yes, obey the governing authorities, but make sure those laws are just, especially in a democratic republic. And then finally, Proverbs 24, 11 through 12, rescue those being led away to death, hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? 
And so, so God says, you can't just say, well, I'm not part of the problem. If you're not actively part of the solution when it comes to systemic stuff, God's going to say, what did you do? Why did you let that happen on your watch? Um, so anyway, there's that. Oh. <laughs> Where is that? Oh, man. Well, and I'm, I'm thinking, too, of, of an Acts 4 with the apostles, you know, uh, Peter and John dragged before uh, those who had just recently crucified Christ, and you know, they tell them, stop it. And so they're... The governing authorities give them a law, and they respond by saying, "Well, are we right to obey God or to obey you? We're going to right. obey God." And it's a powerful reminder. That's uh, uh, let me, um, uh, if you can say a brief word of this too, Adam. That would be great. Um, I'm thinking now of of those in our congregations who are are already pretty inclined towards issues of social justice, um, you know, they're, they're nodding and saying amen throughout this whole conversation. Are there any cautions that you have for folks who are in, in that crowd? Any, um, any dangers there that you, uh, you encourage folks to look out for? Ah, uh, yeah, many. Uh, one is the issue of, of uh, urgency and patience. Be urgent when it comes to changes uh, and making systemic changes. Be urgent when it comes to rescuing people. Be patient with education of individuals. You know, it took a while to get where you are. It took certain impacts in your life, exposure to certain things for you to, to come to the conclusions that you've come to. And when you encounter a person who is way at the beginning of that journey, you're not going to get them from point A to point Z in a day. So uh, try to get them from A to B. We balance that, of course, with that, that warning from the Lord, don't cast your pearls before swine. When a person doesn't want to learn, don't waste your time. But if you see there's a desire to learn, but they're just bungling and misunderstanding it, we have to have patience with that sort of thing and realize that they're not going to jump to an understanding immediately. Um, I would say the other thing is be careful about uh, resistance to partnership, but also be careful about uh, partnering without careful scrutiny. So there's a great organization in LA called Clue, Clergy and Laity United. Uh, we, we work with them. We will protest with them for certain things. There are other things we'll say, well, actually, biblically, I can't align with that. We're still in this together on, on these other things. But you understand, on this, I can't align with you. And I think we have to be very clear about that. Um, there were people, when, when Nehemiah went to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, there were people that he had to call out in the middle of the, of the, of the rebuilding. He's like, wait a minute, you guys are extorting money from your own people. Stop it. And there were other people that he knew had a completely uh, dangerous agenda, Sanballat and Tobiah. And he said, you guys have no part in what we're doing. We're, we're not going to partner with you at all. So I think, for example, when I look at Black Lives Matter, I'm thankful to God for the slogan in and of itself, which, by the way, if anybody has a problem with that slogan, just write a number two at the end of it, and it'll all make sense to you. <laughs> okay. but, uh, but the organization, there may be agenda uh, uh, items that they have that they're pushing for that don't align with our Christian theology. But I think we can successfully partner with them because we need to acknowledge what they are fighting for, basically the dignity of every human being and the protection of every human being under our law. We have to be able to stand with that and to declare that Black Lives Matter uh, while being aware there are going to be some things that they push for that we may not agree with. This whole mentality that I either have to agree with you about everything or we can't do anything together, that gets us in a world of trouble. Don't buy the cable package, no matter what cable package it is. Don't buy the Republican cable package. Don't buy the Democrat cable package. Let's be like the, the angel of the Lord and say, you know, the captain of the Lord's host have I come. When the Democrats are right, I'm going to say they're right. When the Republicans are right, I'm going to say they're right. Everybody's probably going to be mad at me at some point, but I'm probably going to overlap with a lot of people as well and partner when it's time to partner. If we don't do that, Tim, then 
people will just see, they will get the wrong idea. They'll get that Jesus doesn't care. They'll think that Jesus doesn't care. And so, yeah, that's the two things, I guess. Uh, the partnership and then the, the, the patience with those who are learning. Well, both of those are such a great word, and I, I thank you for it. And, um, and I, I, uh, I thank you, too, just for the way I've seen you demonstrate that patience over the years. I'm pretty sure you've demonstrated that patience with me as I've been listening and learning, and I'm, uh, I'm grateful for the way that you, you live out your faith in this and other areas, brother. And so I, I really thank you. I thank you, too, just for giving me some time today, talking with me, talking to our church. You're a blessing, brother. Likewise, Tim. I love you, man. Love you, man. I appreciate you. Awesome. Well, I'll, uh, I'll sign off here. And uh, Lord willing, when we start gathering again as local clergy, we'll, we'll see you soon. Yeah, I look forward to being able to see you in person and without a mask. <laughs> exactly. All right. Bless you, brother. Take care. Bye-bye.